Good morning. Good morning. And it's, it's good to see you all here today. Well, today we have the uh, special pleasure of welcoming back Shoto Spring to Heartland Zen. And um, she will be speaking on a topic that I'm sure is of concern to us all especially recently, finding the mind of peace. Shoto is a Zen priest in the lineage of Uchiyama and Okamura. She is a teacher, an author, a social activist, and she is founder of the Mountains and Waters Alliance in southern rural Minnesota, where she speaks to us, from which she speaks to us today. She is also a practicing psychotherapist. So we welcome, once again, Shoto Spring and um, just give me a moment here. Shoto, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um. As Will mentioned, the matter of a peaceful mind has become more of an issue. I have found it very difficult the past five weeks. Um, and around me, I see people who are finding it difficult to go and ask to give a talk. I said to myself, where's the teaching? What can I offer from the teaching for this problem, which I know is mine and I hear is others? Um, I'm going to start with some uh, ratings, some sayings from the Buddha, from the Sutta Nipata. And I'm beginning with a bit of his words on something called violent conduct. So I'll be reading a lot and saying words to piece things together. Fear results from resorting to violence. Just look at how people quarrel and fight. But let me tell you now of the kind of dismay and terror that I have felt. Seeing people struggling, like fish writhing in shallow water with enmity against one another, I became afraid. At one time, I had wanted to find some place where I could take shelter, but I never saw any such place. There is nothing in this world that is solid at base and not a part of it that is changeless. I had seen them all trapped in mutual conflict, and that is why I had felt so repelled. But then I noticed something buried deep in their hearts. It was, I could just make it out, a dart. It is a dart that makes its victims run all over the place. But once it has been pulled out, all that running is finished, and so is the exhaustion that comes with it. So here is the Buddhist statement, which I'm taking as my beginning. There is something, there's a dart in our hearts that makes us quarrel with each other. We're watching people now, and maybe we're engaging in it ourselves. And the dart can be pulled out. And then he says his advice. 
the bonds of the world should not be pursued. Disenchanted with all sense pleasures, one should train oneself in calmness. A man of wisdom should be truthful, without arrogance, without deceit, not slanderous and not hateful, should go beyond the evil of greed and miserliness. I, he says man now and then. That's, I'm, I'm leaving it alone mostly. Um, to have your mind set on calmness, you must take power over sleepiness, drowsiness, and lethargy. There is no place for laziness and no recourse to pride. Do not be led into lying. Do not be attached to forms. You must see through all pride and fare along without violence. Do not get excited by what is old, do not be contented with what is new. Do not grieve for what is lost or be controlled by desire. A man of wisdom stands on solid ground like a Brahmin, never moving from truth. This person has wisdom, has complete knowledge, has understood the way things are is completely independent. In his perfect wanderings from place to place, she has no envy for anyone. Let there be nothing behind you. Leave the future to one side. Do not clutch at what is left in the middle. Then you will become a wanderer and calm. The future. Leave the future to one side. And somewhere he says, don't worry about the past either. When I look at the people who are paying attention to the war in the Middle East, because there are people who are not paying attention and their lives are easier. But when we are paying attention to this or any other struggle, it's not like there was nothing going on before that. We find ourselves worrying about what will happen tomorrow. We find ourselves wondering who to blame. We find ourselves asking, is there anything at all that I can do? Um, just before this section, he has a couple of sections about causes of contention. And what they amount to is the people who adhere to their views. They say, my view is right and your view is wrong. Sometimes they say, my moral practices are right and those other people's practices are wrong. And I'm going to say, when I look at the present conflict, arguing over what's true and over who has done what and over what sort of actions are justified, I see two sides that are both correct in discussing their victimization over centuries. And I see two sides committing war crimes and claiming that they're morally justified in doing so by their history. And then I see critics saying the history does not justify the war crimes. And right now, most of those critics I see are Jews, rabbis, um, people in Israel saying, don't do that, don't do that in my name. So, but the matter of what the facts are is a problem. And without claiming extensive knowledge, I'm going to say the facts 
support both of these groups in feeling victimized and in having justification for anger. And the more recent facts um, I am now thinking if you are neutral in the face of injustice, you've chosen the side of the persecutor. So I'm not going to claim neutrality. Um, I'm going to go back to the Buddha. So he's talking about the terms of their views being right and perfect. And He's saying, then, the sage, being freed from worldly ties, remains peaceful among the restless, is indifferent among sectarian squabbles, not embracing them while others remain attached. So in this country, there are disputes and contentions. There are arguments. Um, in my personal life, I have one friend who is horrified. Well, no, of that, there, there's a sequence. And so a Facebook friend who I've not met in person, but who is a Buddhist, had just moved to Jerusalem. And somewhere in the first week after the original attack by Hamas, he said, I'm having to recognize that people can do things that I could never imagine. Shortly after that, a Jewish friend who was very pro-Palestinian was horrified that I could imagine thinking, uh, uh, believing the story about the 40 babies. Shortly after that, another friend who I hadn't known was Jewish started ranting at me about Israel's right to defend herself. Sometime after that, a... Um, a friend said he's planning to retire soon and he doesn't know what he'll do next, maybe be running from the Nazis. Jewish name and very Jewish looking person. And of course, what's happening in this country is a little frightening. And meanwhile, um, I have several therapy clients who've been affected, but one of whom has been subjected to numerous anti-Semitic remarks by people she thought were her friends. And I'm trying to help her calm down. But people are having their worlds falling apart in places that we can't expect. And if any of you are in this group, I can just say I'm holding you in my heart and I'm sorry. So there's this question, um, somewhere in the Zen ancestors, I didn't look it up. What's the meaning of the Buddha's whole teaching? Something like that. And the answer is an appropriate response. And so I wanted to begin the explanation, exploration of what might be an appropriate response in a time when people are extremely polarized, legitimately afraid, and clinging very hard to whatever their facts may be, and, and to whoever their sources of information are also. Um, I'm going to throw a few comments about things that I've done, the things that I'm working on. Um, and one of those is that I'm engaging less and less in discussions about what the facts are. It actually does not matter to me and the United States whether there were atrocities or whether you label something an atrocity. 
Is this act worse than that? Um, the second thing I'll say is that when I'm in conversations with the war about the war, I'm being much more careful with my words. And this has been a gradual progression because I so wanted to be the one who had the truth, who had information, who could bring forth a balanced position. And all of my attempts yielded rageful responses from people. I'm happy to say that I have not lost a friend, that we've worked it out um, in all the cases where, where my attempts at help brought distrust and frustration. But it's made me realize just how painful this is for people. Um, I'm continuing to gather information. I make sure that I don't only follow the New York Times and I don't only follow Al Jazeera and I don't only follow Democracy Now. I don't expect anybody to give me the whole picture and I don't expect that I have the whole picture. I only have stories from individuals and this is what it's like here on the ground. And this is what I'm afraid of. And this is what I'm angry at. And everyone is suffering. Um, I usually, um, in the morning, I sit zazen and I do a service. And the service includes the Dahitian Durrani, which is a chant invoking um, Avalokiteshvara's compassion. And it's customary to make requests at the end of that chant. And one of the two places that I have added to, to the standard requests, to people who are sick, I've added people who are threatened, people who are hungry people who are in prison, you know, a whole category of people. And, and I added who are threatened. I added a chant for people who are doing great harm. And the words to that roughly are, may they return to wholeness and change their actions. I chant for leaders that they may act with both wisdom and courage. And sometimes I put words, in, names in there. So it was pretty obvious that I would begin to chant for the people in Israel and the people in Gaza. Very obvious. I've expanded that a little bit. Um, along with some people who are sick or dying or, you know, or the usual chant for some people who have died. Um, it's the one thing that I know for sure that I can do safely. And it's important to me to include evildoers or people who I think are doing evil. I'm aware that there are people who think Hamas is freedom fighters. I don't think there are currently a lot of those people, but there are some. And I'm also aware that there are people who think that Israel has been attacked since it was born and they have to defend themselves no matter what they do. And I'm aware that the United States has been alone in supporting the actions of Israel. And in spite of mass demonstrations, our elected people have um, have refused even to ask for a ceasefire. So I'm aware of all of these things. And so 
I've started chanting for Joe Biden, which I wasn't. I'm chanting for Benjamin Netanyahu and the leaders of Hamas, both of whom are in the doing great evil category. Um, choosing who to put where is something I just like, I don't know. I just do it, but it feels safe to do it. And it feels like a little better than casting them out of my heart, a little better than saying, well, there's nothing I can do. I can do this one thing. So later I want to invite conversation both about how any of you might be affected by this particular thing and about ways that you have found to participate. I have a collection of encouraging stories. Um, and I'm going to read a few. They're from a book called Zen Teachings in Challenging Times, which is all writings by Soto Zen women priests. And it was published in 2017, so way before this happened, 2018. So I won't read them all. But here's one from a very respected teacher at the San Francisco Zen Center. I think I won't say names, but I have studied and practiced with her. In 2008, she had a major accident, was seriously injured and was spending her time seeing doctors and being rehabilitated. So this is her And then in 2010, she was hit by a car. And um, it said, later my students said I had tried to run, but the SUV was going too fast. Apparently I had taken a full stunt roll over the vehicle. My toe had caught in some part of the front of the car, dragging me 16 feet along the street on my face. Woke up in a hospital bed, half my face broken, weeping tears of blood, high level of pain management, physically miserable, very little sleep. Questions and doubts would come up. Is my life pretty much over? I don't think I can make it for another hour unless I can find a comfortable position and there isn't one. How can I help anyone if I'm like this? And then one night after midnight, something new happened. Suddenly the intuition arose that if my lifetime practice was true, it was true right now. When could a practice be tested more thoroughly than in a catastrophe? Though I could not yet sit, I decided to do sasam. And so she had the nurse arrange her with a straight spine. And she began the practice. Breathing, being present. She says, in the next hour, the despair began to clear and my mind to settle. The next few days, I did sasam in my bed every night. The nurses began to come and sit with me. I was able to instruct them. One nurse said, there is light in this room. And then there's various stories about how it went from there. But I will say that I had forgotten that she had all these injuries when I saw her at Minnesota Zen Center a few weeks ago, giving a day long teaching on sewing the Okesa, and then a shorter um, talk that I was able to attend. I was like, I don't know what happened, but practice carried her through.
another woman who I practiced with. Well, first she writes about having her first baby. Everything perfect, you know, hot tub, loving spouse, all this stuff. And saying at the end of it, I don't know anyone ever has a second baby. <laughs> um, but she forgot, and she did. And um, four and a half years later, she says, I'm moving down the Hall of Hope which leads to the newborn infant something unit. And um, our baby has a good chance, we're told. But pretty soon she came to understand that a younger child did not have one until like eight weeks early. And um, various things are happening. And um, finally, she says, are we letting her go? And the doctor says, we don't decide that, but that would be the best. So she says, here's what's important. It's not at all what I want, but my daughter's life is going to be very brief. And if I don't get with that program, I'm going to miss it. So I got with that program and I didn't miss it. She held that baby and talked to her about life, about little things about life. The sound of crickets at night. And she sang to her. And they had the family come and the older daughter. And, um, and then they took the tubes out. She said her pure little heart keeps beating for a long time. And then she quotes, in birth there is nothing but birth, and in death there is nothing but death. Accordingly, when birth comes, face and actualize birth, and when death comes, face and actualize death. Do not avoid them or desire them. But Dogen says, I have a poem from Adrian Rich, which appeared in this book. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. So here we are. Mm. She wrote it in another time. I don't remember what time it was. That people are being hurt, are suffering enormously, are starving, are dying of thirst, are dying in rubble, are watching their loved ones be hostages or are hostages themselves with no idea what will happen next. Ask my lot with those who with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world. That's ours, reconstitute the world. And just one more. This is a Gary Snyder story. And... He was in Japan, he was in Kyoto, and you know, he loved poetry. And he was sitting in a bar and he met a government, an American government official, and they talked all night. The government official was Daniel Ellsberg says he left deeply impressed. He had never before met a man who could not be bought. 
sometime down the road, his own conscience irretrievably awakened, he exposed the scandal of water. These are the things that can happen when the Dharma grabs us and we go forward with courage. You know, we've seen many instances of courage in our era, even just the past 20 years. Many of the people who who made those acts of courage are either in prison or in exile right now. Some of them are dead. But there it is, changing a nation, changing the course of history, just through the practice, just through a random chance encounter. We never know what effect we will have. Um, have to add there's a thing going around particularly with environmentalists about what humans are like and the story is that humans are bad and that the world would be better off without us and I've started hunting up responses to that story well actually i'm writing a book and there's a whole you know like there are many pages devoted to responses to that story but they're mostly historical responses about how humans have been so when i looked in the teachings what do i find i don't find that the buddhism does not say humans are bad Buddhism says humans can be influenced by the three poisons, greed, hate, and delusion. Um, the Buddha himself said to Ajavaka, who was a demon, who uh, had a very funny way of but he did in fact ask for teaching and he says what is the best wealth to a man in this world what is the good practice that brings happiness what is the sweetest of all tastes what manner of living is said to be the noblest kind the buddha says confidence is the best wealth to a man in this world well-practiced dhamma brings the most happiness truth is the sweetest of all tastes Living with wisdom is said to be the noblest kind. So he asks, oh, three or four more questions. And in each time, the first response, the first part of the answer is confidence. Confidence in the Dharma. the confident householder in whom there are four virtues. And then we have Govindam. Trust the way. Trust that you are in the way. I have not found anyone who said humans are evil in spite of the stories that, that appear in these texts. No. Humans are vulnerable mistakes and humans are also susceptible to the truths to the teaching to love to compassion to community and to wise action and compassionate action all of those things I mentioned that there were going to be that I had two questions and I'm not sure how to bring them forward but I'm going to ask or invite um, you to respond 
to either of these questions. The first one is how, how are you personally being affected? It doesn't have to be the war in the Middle East. It could be something else that affects you, but something that makes it difficult and that you need help from peace. If anyone would like to um, offer a story or response. And the other one is, are there actions you have found? Then of course, you can always ask a question. So I'm going to pause there and rest of this will be our, our conversation. Thank you so much, Shoto, uh, for your for your teachings, for your readings, and for the heart that you displayed today. Um, then we will um, stop the recording at this point, so that people.